Now, before I introduce the next act, I need a little bit of help here. This is the New York Times Magazine from this Sunday. And on the crossword page, I'm having trouble with one of these clues. It's a uh, one, two, three, four, five. It's a five-letter, seven-across clue, right at the top, and the clue is Comic Sweeney. <laughs> Does any, can anybody help me out with that? <laughs> Julia. Oh, there you go. You know you've made it when the, the writers of the New York Times magazine assume that every reader is going to know who Comic Sweeney is. Julia Sweeney, of course, is our next, our next act. Let me get my notes here. You've seen her on Saturday Night Live for many years. You've seen her in the movies. You've seen her in Sex in the City. Julia says in her play about letting go of God that she, when she was a young girl, she wanted to be a nun. Well, she played a nun in Sex and the City. Have, have any of you ever, ever seen that episode? It's pretty hilarious there. She's an author. If it's not one thing, it's your mother. She's very... <laughs> Do we have those books here? Do we have that book? Oh, we have the DVD of it? Okay. Uh, she's also a, a playwright, and she, uh, she's written three one-woman monologue plays, God Said Ha!, huh? In the Family Way and Letting Go of God, in which she tells her hilarious story of how she let go of God. So, without any more comments, Julia Sweeney. Okay, oh my God, I'm having so much fun here. I love this convention so much. I really am vowing never to miss it again, ever, ever. It's so important and so great. So before I get into the material I've prepared for you, um, I just wanted to make some comments. One to Roy Zimmerman, who's so great. I actually wish you were, I wish I was first and you were at the end. But I do have a comment about, um, and maybe a complaint about your Rift Valley song. Because, um, just in the last couple months, my husband Michael and daughter Mulan and I did our 23andMe. I wanted to do the 23andMe and find out about our genealogy. And my husband said, well, why? Because we did the National Geographic one and we're, all, we're not all biologically related. My husband's Jewish, I'm Irish, Northern European, and our daughter's Chinese. And we did the National Geographic thing and it was, you know, it was just what we thought. <laughs> it was like no surprises. And um, so he said, why do you want to do the 23 and Me?" And I said, because I want confirmation that I'm a Neanderthal. And he said, why would you say that? Which is something he says to me a lot. Why would you say that? Sometimes it's like, why would you say that? And sometimes it's like, why would you say that? And I said, because I just feel like I'm a ne Neanderthal. I mean, just look at me. Don't I seem like a Neanderthal? And he's like, what? And I go, well, when they have those pictures of Neanderthal families, that just seems like very familiar. <laughs> it just seems like, oh, those are my people. And um, I really like the cold. I'm really good on the cold. And I just feel it. And he's like, oh, that's ridiculous. Okay, so then we do it, and we get the information back, and he forwards me this thing on my computer that says, Julia Sweeney, you are in the top 2% of all the people who've done 23andMe that has Neanderthal ancestry. Neanderthal! Woo! So now I go around the house going, rrr, rrr. it was funny to them for a day. But anyway, now I feel like you can't diss the Neanderthals because here I am. All right, okay. Okay, Annie Laurie, do you have some picture in your office that is aging? I don't understand how you can look so beautiful year after year. She is so gorgeous. I think there's something, ha I think there's some witchcraft going on there. All right. <laughs> um, okay, oh God, Kimberly Veal was so great. So I was only here today because I had to do another talk last night in Columbus, Ohio. So I only came this morning, so I only saw four talks. But um, I loved Kimberly, I loved your talk so much. 
And I feel like I'm kind of going through the same thing. Like I went through my atheist time. I am an atheist. I don't expect that to change. But then um, I got tired of saying atheist all the time when people asked me about myself because I felt like that just tells so little about me. That just tells you about one tiny thing that I think. Um, and I felt like I wanted to be more part of a community group and I wanted to give more back to the community. So um, I ended up joining the Unitarian Church of Evanston, which is near me. And they're mostly atheist, and um, although much less atheist than I expected. <laughs> um, and, um, and it's been this really, really mostly great experience. I got to be part of this um, group that mentored a Syrian family that I fell in love with. And um, the, the little thing that I was inspired to tell you about about it is that, um, so it was just about a year ago, and because I had a minivan, I went to the airport, and in the group that we'd prepared this apartment and all this stuff, and I picked them up, and it's uh, parents who are in their late 40s, and they have four kids, um, a 24-year-old, a 22-year-old, a 19-year-old, and a 15-year-old. And they'd been in this Turkish refugee camp for a few years, and I just fell so hard in love with them on the way back. Like, they were so loving with each other and laughing, and, and they were always saying, of course, inshallah, ah, and then I, and I, I thought, oh, I, I didn't even know how I felt about hearing that so often. And, um, and then only after, so then I got to really got to know this family. I mean, really, I've spent like a couple days visiting them a week, probably for the last year, and then finally, I told them that I, because I, they said, they kept saying, well, they learned more English, and then they were saying, um, you know, Angela, ah, you know, if God wills it, they were saying it so much, and then so finally, I said, you know, I just have to say that, um, <laughs> you know, I'm an atheist, <laughs> and so when you say Angela, to me, that's great, but to me, it's like if fate allows, or you know, I just I just take it this different way. And they actually were really great about it. Um, but then, only recently, in the last month, actually, the youngest son Uday, who I've really gotten to know, I took him to guitar classes. I really love this family. He started. <laughs> he, so the other women are, who are in the group who are mentoring this Syrian family are all. Um, Christian, and I didn't really know that when we put ourselves together, because I just, I just thought the, all the Unitarians were atheists, but anyway, okay, so they're Christian, so that's okay, okay, we're helping people, okay, that's fine, and um, so then Uday says he wanted me to watch these videos about becoming a Muslim, and and I said, oh, you know, oh, God, <laughs> I don't like, oh, oh, so I watched a couple of them, and I go, you know, I'm really, you know, I'm pretty set, pretty set, um, in my beliefs, I really don't think I'm going to become a Muslim. And of course, they have no idea that I've done this show, Letting Go of God, or that I go to these conventions and all the time. It's like, I'm really so much farther than you think. <laughs> but anyway, um, he said to me, he goes, oh, Julia, though, but the other women in the group who are helping us, they already are Christian, but you are nothing. <laughs> You're so close. And I realized to him, it was like I didn't have a boyfriend. Like, <laughs> a boyfriend, it's like you can have our boyfriend. Anyway, um, I just was inspired to tell you that by Kimberly. Um, oh, and then Brent, oh my God, he was so great. And he gave me this necklace and I just love him. And I'm going to go visit him at the reservation. And that was so great. That's all I have to say about that. Okay, Michelle Goldberg, I've loved her for so long. Every time she's on MSNBC talking to Chris Hayes, I go crazy and yell into the air. So to be able to see her here was such a great thing. Okay, this is what I have to ask her. Will you please write a book, a prescient book about the secular movement in the United States that's happening right now. And maybe the FFRF is really like just the toe of the elephant and you can't see the entire rest of the elephant, but you write this fantastic prescient book about secular America and then in 11 years we take over. Okay. Okay. And I have nothing to say about Steven Pinker except that I love him and every book he writes just blows my mind and changes everything. Even, even your sense of style book about grammar changed my life. Like Steven Pinker can't stop rocking my world every time he writes something. Okay. 
that's my comments. Now I'm getting to the meat of my talk, which is very, I'm a little worried about it because um, I kind of just gave myself this assignment and I told Annie Laurie that I was gonna do this and I really don't know if this is something that will be of interest to you and it might just be depressing, but let's just see how it goes and I can run off stage or answer questions if it starts going south. Okay. So this, was the, this is what the assignment I gave myself. I thought, I am going to watch su financially successful religious movies that were released in the last year and give you, you know, my opinion of them, let you know the lay of the land. And I realized right away that my task was not so easy as that. And by the way, I'm a huge movie person. That's my hobby and my love and my everything. I watch probably five films a week. I love the movies. So to have to stop my movie-going love affair to watch these Christian movies was a, was a sacrifice, people. <laughs> but I did it for you. Um, but I first had to think, okay, well, what does that mean, religious movie? Which was a really interesting thing to think about because the horror genre is enormous and, you know, that's really like religious movies. Like, you have to buy into a lot of stuff for a lot of those films. And I hate horror films, and I just thought I'm ruling out horror films. But there's a film that came out this year called Annabelle Creation. It cost $15 million, and it's made $100 million at the box office domestically, so it's hugely successful. And it's all about a de demonically possessed doll. And there was another, it's a prequel of another, which was also a pre prequel called Annabelle in 2014. And so I was thinking, the Catholic Church must be so embarrassed about these horror films that come out that kind of really take their ideology to the most ridiculous extent. What does the Catholic Church really have to say about these horror films? So just, I just took Annabelle creation, didn't watch it, but saw that it was hugely financially successful. And I thought, okay, I'm just gonna see what the Catholics have to say about it. And I immediately found an article that, this is just August 20th, 2017, recently, in the National Catholic Register, which is a mainstream Catholic publication. And it was an interview with a priest about what he thought about Annabelle creation. And I just want to read part of it to you. <laughs> okay, what children read, what they see on the screen, can inspire them toward greater faithfulness. Conversely, it can lead them into the sordid world of the occult, even opening them to demonic possession. Father Robert, a priest for more than 10 years and an experienced exorcist. So I'm just reading this going, what? knows firsthand the unintended consequences when children or adults open the door to demonic activity. You guys, this is like a mainstream Catholic publication. Oftentimes, he says, demonic possession begins because gets, kids get curious after reading books like, say, Harry Potter. An important part of Father Robert's ministry is training other priests at the Vatican's official exorcism Institute of America. From across the country and around the world, I just have to say, I am this kind of almost Catholic apologist because I lost my faith, I'm an atheist, and I was Catholic, but I liked being Catholic. So people always think I have some big beef against the Catholic Church, and I would say, no, and I'm always saying how the Catholics aren't so bad. Then I have to read this. Okay. <laughs> From across the country and around the world, Catholic priests come to the Institute to learn the secrets of this ancient rite so that they too can exercise demons and evil spirits. Is Annabelle creation faithful to church teachings? This woman asked Father Robert. Father Robert explained that the devil will only go where he is invited. He talked of two cases he knew of personally in which two young women, not realizing the gravity of their request, had invited any spiritual being to help them. The consequence was that they exhibited symptoms of demonic possession and then required an exorcism. Yeah. And then he goes on, and then the publication goes on to tell you the five signs of demonic possession. 
And all, all I kept thinking about, we'll talk about the witch trials. I just kept thinking about foreigners, women, knowledge, information, just all those things in your head. Okay, here's the five signs of demonic possession. One, hidden knowledge. If a person has knowledge, they should not have had. <laughs> That's just a sign of demonic possession. Okay, two, languages, speaking in an unfamiliar language. Three, superhuman strength. Father Robert said he knew of a five foot four girl who was 110 pounds who threw five large men off of her who were trying to hold her down during an exorcism. <laughs> oh my God. Five, extreme aversion to the sacred, such as an unwillingness to go to church. <laughs> yes. And five, levitation. Father Robert had personal knowledge of a case in Louisiana this year in which a person was seated in a chair and was able to levitate and proceed down the hall away from the priest. <laughs> Whoa! Okay. I can't believe they allow that stuff. I mean, well, I guess I can. Okay, that brings me, okay, you guys, I know you're looking to laugh, but I just need to rant to you. Okay, do you guys know about Bill Donahue, the guy who's the head of the Catholic League? Okay, I did not realize until I started researching, because then I was like on my Catholic thing, so I started going around the web looking at stuff, and I hate this guy so much. I mean, ugh, okay, he has so much power. He says he has 350,000 followers, but I think that's just like who give their email address to him. I mean, I don't think it's really members because he's really funded by the Heritage Foundi Foundation. Um, he's actually kind of responsible for Trump being in office. It's true. And that is because, well, first of all, let me just tell you about this guy. He sided with Al-Qaeda um, with the attack on the Charlie Hedbo attack in Paris because he said that people should not insult religious figures, and if they do so, murder is justified. He thinks that marriage, um, marriage is not about love or making people happy, but about reproduction, which really made me laugh because, and when I say laugh, I mean cry, laugh, hard, laugh. Okay, um, I, I've been married twice, that's right. The second one stuck. But the first time I got married, I got married in the Catholic Church, and we had to go to, the, to this priest, and we had to do these counseling sessions with this priest. And I remember my first husband, Steve, and I went, and the priest said, um, now, do you know what marriage is, the purpose of marriage? And I remember there was just like this long pause. And then Steve said, to love one another. <laughs> Something like, like we were, I was like, to look out for one another? And he said, no, it's about having children. And I said, well, what if you can't have children? And he said, well, then it's not really a marriage. Yeah, that's what he said to us. And yet, I still got married, which I don't understand that. Okay. Um, he thinks that the reports of priests' sexual abuse is wildly overblown and that there's way more sexual abuse among secular people and that secular liberals are just trying to put a spotlight on the priests and it's all unfair. So that when, um, when Anthony Weiner did, had his final picture in the paper that showed the picture that he sent to the girl that had his four-year-old son Jordan in it, it was Bill Donahue who called the New York City Administration for Children's Services and urged them to investigate Weiner and, and investigate him for sexually, you know, abusing his son, basically. And New York City agreed to do the investigation. They sent it to the FBI. And then on October 3rd last year, that's when the FBI agents went in and got Weiner's computer. And that's when they found those emails. I mean... <laughs> <laughs> I'm really not doing a comedy set. I'm just telling you who you should, who you should hate more. <laughs> okay, so let's get back to the movies. And my segue with that, with Bill Donahue, is that he loved The Passion of the Christ. And one thing I really realized that that movie, Mel Gibson's movie, The Passion of the Christ, which made so much more money than anyone ever thought, which is really like a violent porn film. It's like Christians should hate this movie. It's like two hours of Jesus being scourged and one minute of Jesus saying, turn the other cheek or something, and then two hours of just out-and-out -out violence. 
And yet it became this huge popular movie at churches. And that's what kind of started, I learned, this movement of churches sort of, and, and the Hollywood film industry sort of coming together and making these films. And <laughs> so the first film I saw was Hacksaw Ridge, which some of you might have seen. And actually, this is considered one of the mainstream, you know, Christian films that made a lot of money. And it's by Mel Gibson. So Mel Gibson obviously has some thing about violence, horrible flesh burning, legs being torn off, beating, grenades blowing up people's insides. He loves that kind of violence, but he likes to center it on a main character who's a pacifist. So that was like the same thing with Jesus, and that's exactly what he did with Hacksaw Ridge. And <laughs> so I started reading about the real guy. So the real guy, Desmond Doss, he was a Seventh-day Adventist, and actually he so is worthy of a film. I mean, he's a, he's a really interesting case because he was a pacifist, but he didn't think he was a conscientious objector. He was a conscientious obliger or something like that, he called them. Like, he would go, he wanted to be a medic at the front, but he refused to touch a gun. And, um, and he was, I think, maybe a little touched. And I, and, I, and I think that he brought up a lot of complicated things in the military that Mel Gibson a little bit explores, but nothing compared to the real story. And it's almost like Mel Gibson wants to have it both ways. He wants to be able to glorify this pacifist, but then he wants to get all the blood and guts into it. But <laughs> one of the things that made me literally laugh out loud in this movie. So Desmond Doss, he's not going to touch a gun. He's only going to save people. And at one point, he goes up to a guy who's had his legs blown off. He puts him on a stretcher, and he's carrying the stretcher on his back through the you know, the gunfire, and the guy on the stretcher, who's had his legs blown off, picks up a machine gun and starts mowing down Japanese servicemen behind him. It's that kind of movie. And <laughs> I just want to say the movie cost $40 million, and it's made $175 million so far. Um, and let me see. Okay, here's the thing. This is like the kind of thing that going down this rabbit hole I learned is that often the real story is actually really interesting and complicated and they don't use it. For example, this guy Desmond Doss, this is the true story. He finally, oh, a grenade is thrown towards him and his fellow soldiers and he throws himself on the grenade. He gets all this shrapnel all over his body, on his lower body, he gets put on a stretcher himself and as they're taking him on the stretcher, he sees a guy who's in worse shape than him he throws himself off the stretcher. He elbows his way over to the guy who's actually more wounded than him, insists that that guy get on the stretcher, and then stays there, and then is shot by a Japanese sniper. That's actually the real story. But Mel Gibson doesn't tell that part of it, because he, when he was interviewed, he said, oh, that's just too much, that's just too much. He just wanted, <laughs> yeah! And yet, I feel like he just missed the greatest part of the story. Okay. Oh, aren't you so happy to be educated by this at the end of this day? Okay, so there's basically what I learned is there's, there's basically two big producers in Hollywood of Christian films. And one is the kind of down and dirty cheap ones, and one is the main studio big ones. So the down and dirty ones are all made by this place called Pure Flix. And the first one that came out is God's Not Dead. Now, how many of you have seen God's Not Dead? Oh, so there's some of you. Okay. Okay, if you want to be depressed slash totally entertained, <laughs> you should rent God's Not Dead. So God's Not Dead is all about this professor who's sort of like Richard Dawkins, except it's not at all like Richard Dawkins. And this young kid goes to college and he takes Philosophy 101. And the teacher on the first day says, you've got to sign a paper saying that God is dead because God is dead and I'm not even going to teach this class unless you accept that God is dead. And everyone in the class sheepishly writes God is dead except for this one kid who says, I can't sign that paper and not only that, I'm going to debate you in three debates and prove to you that, <laughs> that God is not dead. And the, and the way, of course, all the atheists in the movie, there's three main atheists in the movie, and they're all showed as such crazy God-hating villains. Like, every single one of them 
isn't really an atheist. They're just mad at God. And <laughs> so, for example, the professor, um, at one point, um, the student says, why do you hate God so much? And the professor says, because he took everything away from me that I loved. <laughs> oh, my God. And then the other atheist in the movie is this horrible, he just cares about making money, and he's mean to his girlfriend. When she tells him that she has cancer, he dumps her right during the same dinner because he's an atheist. That's what they do. <laughs> and his mother has Alzheimer's and was a Christian, but he doesn't take care of his mother even though you know she needs care. And there's this great scene where he goes to his mother and she's sort of blankly watching the TV screen that's just like, you know, sand on the TV screen. And he says, Mom, I'm an atheist, and you know I just love to make money. And you've prayed and believed, this is the kind of writing I just wanna say. You've prayed and believed your whole life, and you've never done anything wrong. And you're the nicest person I know, and I'm the meanest, angriest person I know. You know how mean, angry people are always just making that announcement. And now you have dementia, but my life is perfect. Why don't you explain that to me? And then his mother suddenly comes out of her dementia for this one moment. You know how that happens with people with dementia, when they're suddenly clicking. And she says, sometimes the devil allows people to live a life of trouble because he doesn't want them to turning to God. Your sin is like a jail cell, except it's nice and comfy, and there doesn't seem to be any need to leave. The door's wide open, till one day time runs out, and the cell door slams shut, and suddenly it's too late. And then she turns to him and says, excuse me, who are you anyway? <laughs> Okay, you guys, this movie was made for $2 million and it's made $140 million. And it actually started this whole company, Pure Flix, that now has made many, many of these films. And let me just say, the overall point of all these Pure Flix films is not even about Christianity. It, they, no one ever really talks about what it means to be a Christian or any difficulty being a Christian besides saying, I love Jesus and that's the end of it and your life's great. It's really all about vilifying secularists. It's all about saying that secularists are terrible people. That's the whole point of the movie. Okay, so then because that was so popular, they had to make God's Not Dead too. <laughs> I thought at least it could be T-O-O -O or something like that. No, it's just God's Not Dead too, And that was made for five million. It's so far made 23 million, not as much, but still. Pretty good return on that money. Okay, Annie, Lauren, Dan, you might be in the wrong business. All right. No, they're not. Okay, so God Not Dead 2, God's Not Dead 2 um, stars Melissa Joan Hart. She's a t teacher of history in a public school, and she tries to keep her Christianity to herself. And her father is played by Pat Boone. I'm not kidding. And in her class, they're talking about nonviolence, violent resistance, and she's talking about MLK and Gandhi. And then a girl in the class whose parents are atheists, which means that their son died six months before and they had no feelings about it. That's how you can tell. And um, she raises her hand and says, wasn't Jesus a pacifist? And Melissa Joan Hart goes, oh, oh. You can tell she knows she's not supposed to mention Jesus' name in the public school. She says, um, according to the writers of the Bible, Jesus did say, love your enemies. And all of a sudden, of course, she's broken the rule. She's mentioned Jesus, and she's hauled before the school board, and they say, you know you're not supposed to mention Jesus in a public school. And she says, but I was asked a question, and I was just teaching history, and he's historical. And they followed him, and they said, we need you to sign a statement saying, I've made a horrible mistake. And she says, 
I'd rather, she has a statement like, I'd rather be, rather be fight with God against the world than be with the world and fight against God. Okay, then, <laughs> then the girl's parents, the girl who asked the question, um, they say, I can't believe they said the word Jesus in your history class. We're going to get the ACLU on this case and make millions of dollars <laughs> suing the school. And now you're going to get into an Ivy League school, daughter, because you're going to be a famous girl who had this case about the horrible teacher who said Jesus in the classroom. <sighs> um, and uh, Pat Boone has, so then Melissa Joan Hart goes home to her, her father, Pat Boone, who says things, that's the thing about atheism, they take away the pain. They, they don't take away the pain, they just take away all the hope. <laughs> oh, this is my favorite Pat Boone quote in the whole of God, It's Not Dead 2. They seem to forget the most basic human right of all is the right to know Jesus. <laughs> It's like, really? That's the most basic human right of all. But you guys, this is what we're up against. Okay. Oh, God. Oh, and then it's so funny because the atheist parents just don't care about their son that's died. they like, our son died six months ago. We boxed off his, uh, his stuff. Daughter, um, the Salvation Army's coming over soon. Can you just give them all this stuff that, uh, you know, that your brother had? And she's like, oh, okay. And then the Salvation Army comes, and they find a Bible in the son's room. He was a Christian. They didn't know it. Okay, thanks for laughing, because these, they're just going to get worse. Okay. And you know, when it just gets unbearable, I'm going to stop. All right. Okay, the next Pure Flix movie. Where's my list of all the ones, the Pure Flix? Oh, Pure Flix is making so much money. Old Fashioned. Oh, God, Old Fashioned. It's about a Christian carpenter who runs an antique shop in a town who used to be wild in college. And in fact, he made Girls Gone Wild videos. And uh, now he just is the carpenter in the town because he's accepted Jesus into his heart. And this girl, this free-spirited girl who just gets in a car and drives till the gas runs out. That's how many no rules in her life she has. She runs out of gas near his place. And they have an attraction. And he tells her that he, oh, she asks him, she rents an apartment above his antique store. And she needs something fixed, and then he says, I'm sorry, I can't come in. I have a, I've got a personal rule where I'm never in a room alone with a woman I'm not married to. <laughs> Thinking, oh my God, because you're so horrible, <laughs> you would just like start assaulting someone if you were alone with them. Um, and she goes, oh, um, so you're only in the room with your wife, and he goes, well, I'm not married. And then that starts this romance between them where he reveals himself to be the most screwed up, controlling person in the world, and he takes her to a preacher, and he makes them do workbooks about if they will be compatible together before they can go on a date, and it's so insufferable. And this movie opened against Fifty Shades of Grey. Which I have to say, you know, it is kind of smart. It is true. I mean, there's, Hollywood comes out with a lot of crass sexual stuff. It really isn't for everyone. I mean, not just because if people are Christian or prudish about it, but it, like, like for me, Fifty Shades of Grey is a horrific film. And it just, it just breaks my heart that there isn't other options out there that are better options than those. Like, it's, it's really got to be Fifty Shades of Grey or this crazy, wacko Christian guy movie. Okay, then I watched The Case for Christ, the Lee Strobel story. So I read that book. When I was actually going through my personal faith journey, I read Lee Strobel's book, The Case for Christ, which sold a zillion copies, where he's a Chicago reporter who's trying to prove God doesn't exist, but realize God does exist. <laughs> and then he wrote a book, and it sold millions of copies. And now there's this movie, 
And it didn't do as well. It, it cost three million. It only made 17 million at the box office. Um, and he's got great 80s kind of longish hair, the guy who plays Lee Strobel. And he's a rising star at the Chicago Tribune. And then his daughter um, chokes on something at a restaurant. And the woman who knows how to do the Heimlich remover at a restaurant, which is a miracle that someone would know how to do the Heimlich remover at a, maneuver at a restaurant, and saves his daughter's life. Then his wife becomes a Christian because of that. <laughs> um, because then the woman who saves the girl's life, he says, thank you. And she goes, you know, Jesus sent me here. I was going to Applebee's, <laughs> but I came here and saved your daughter because Jesus knew I had to do the Heimlich maneuver. So then the wife becomes a Christian. Lee Strobel's character, very upset about his wife becoming a Christian, and he decides to write a story for the Chicago Tribune where he's going to prove there is no God, but then he gets some great advice from his the reporter who's above him, like his managing editor, he says, I don't even know what angle to come at it from to prove there is no God. How can I do it? And then my wife will read my article and she'll realize there is no God. And his editor says, um, I'll tell you what you need to do. All you need to do is debunk the resurrection and it will all fall like a house of cards. And so then he starts investigating the resurrection, which to him, he keeps trying to prove it didn't happen, but then he keeps finding out it did by going to people like Faye Dunaway playing a s important psychologist at a university who, what I think is so hilarious is she says, um, she says something like, uh, he goes, how can the gospels be true? They contradict themselves, the four gospels. So. Obviously, they're not true, and she says something like, you know, witnesses, when they give testimony, are always contradict each other. So the very fact that the Gospels contradict each other proves they're true! <laughs> and then he goes, oh! And then he goes to leave, and then she stops him and says, can I ask you a question? Do you have daddy issues? And he's like, oh, it's true, I did hate my father, and that means I hate God. Oh, I've said it! <laughs> also, these movies, I keep thinking, why are they trying to convince people with facts at all? I mean, why don't they just say, believe it on faith? That's what I find so interesting. This is my theory. People who don't have good critical thinking skills are kind of wandering around in the Christian world, but they like to think that if you really looked into it, it could be proven that it was true, even though you don't have to prove it's true. You can just say that it's on faith, but if you did look into it, you would find out it was true. And then they make these movies where people kind of sound like they're saying facts, and they sort of sound like they're good critical thinkers, except that it's just completely absurd and ridiculous. And then the end of the movie is like, that's right, and they can even prove the resurrection. That's my theory. Okay. Oh, God, you guys, are you like, that's it, Julia. You've got two movies and you're out of here. <laughs> okay, I'm not ashamed. I'm not ashamed is a hard one. First of all, it's the most ridiculous movie. It's about a girl that was killed at Columbine where they retroactively went back and made her a much, much bigger Christian than she ever was. She, right before she was killed at Columbine, apparently she went up to like 10 different people and told them that God loved them and she, guys who like have Down syndrome, she wanted to date them and other guys that were horrible, she told them that everything was gonna work out okay. And then she was killed at Columbine. Um, that one is a bad one for the atheist, I have to say. Even though it's completely disproved, it's based on this idea that she was killed next to this guy who said that the Columbine killers said, do you believe in God? And she said, yes. And they said, well, then go be with your God. But then later, that same guy said, well, I don't know if that's actually what they said. <laughs> like, maybe I didn't hear anything. And maybe everything was terrible. But anyone, that obviously really vilifies the atheists. Okay, let's get out of pure flicks. Let's move on to the big money movies. Okay, so Sony has a division called Affirm Films where they make big budget movies with big stars that are religious movies. So their movies are, for example, Heaven is for Real, Miracles from Heaven, Risen, The Shack, The War Room. Okay, so Heaven is for Real is about the guy whose four-year-old son went to heaven 
He wrote a book, he, because he got sick, his appendix burst, he went to the hospital, and while they were operating on him, his four-year-old son, who was completely primed with all this religious imagery and completely coached, that they even show in the movie, did you talk to God? Was, did God have wings? Was there rainbows around? They completely, you know, they even just show that in the movie. They don't care. Um, the guy wrote this book about it. It sold 20 million copies, the book. Then they made this movie that stars Greg Kinnear, which is like, I feel like Greg Kinnear, who I've never met, but I feel a little peery with him. Like, if I met him, I would feel like he's a comedian. And I just feel like, what? Why? Why would you make evidence for real? And I think it's because it cost $10 million to make and made $100 million at the box office. I think that might be why. Um, then there's Miracles from Heaven, starring Jennifer Gardner. And that's about a woman whose daughter, who has an intestinal problem, um, where she's got all these tubes and her lower intestine doesn't work and she's got all these doctors working on her and uh, her daughter plays in a tree and falls down the middle of this dead tree and hits her head and her intestines start working again and it's a miracle! And it's so great because at the end um, she's crying because she was going to lose her faith too because of her daughter. Um, but then her daughter's well again so she believes in God again and then at the end they you can tell how they're trying to appeal to a religious and a slightly skeptical audience they want to get all everybody so at the end of the movie um she goes I think Jennifer Gardner's like it was a miracle it's a miracle because God loves my daughter and me and we prayed so hard and now she's gonna live and then she says you know Einstein once said, there's, and uh, anytime Einstein is quoted, you just know, oh God. Um, if Einstein could come back, he'd never stop throwing up over all the quotes that were attributed to him. Um, there are only two ways to live your life, as though nothing is a miracle, or as if everything is a miracle. Which, okay, just think about that statement. <laughs> that is a completely nothing statement. That's just saying it's complete bullshit, every single, like. But then in the movie, so Jennifer Gardner says that, and then she goes in, so after my daughter had her miracle of getting well again, I realized, you know what? Everything's a miracle. The sun came up, it's a miracle. The grass is growing, it's a miracle. My husband's face, my house, my car, it's a miracle. And then I looked it up and Einstein, that's been debunked. Einstein didn't even say that. It's just like, I love these quotes from the big celebrities that turned out to be debunked. My favorite one is the George Eliot quote, it's never too old to become whoever you were meant to be. She never said that. Plus, all of George Eliot's books, the theme is sometimes you're too old to be anything. Okay. Like, really, her theme is the opposite of that quote. Yet, I have seen that on a sticker on a refrigerator at least 10 times. Okay. Oh my God, then there's Risen. That's the other one from Afern Films. That's where there's a guy, a Roman centurion. It's 33 AD. I think you know what's happening. <laughs> Jesus, this guy named Jesus has risen from the dead. And um, they call this Roman tribune in, and he basically becomes Columbo. They go, you've got to investigate this crazy guy, Jesus. And also... There's all these, you know, Jewish people there who look so horrible and they're like, we can't have a Messiah like that. You better debunk this Jesus. And then the Roman Tribune goes out and he interviews all the apostles and he's practically, he is kind of like Columbo. He's like, now let me get this straight. Like, it's really hilariously Columbo investigates the resurrection. My favorite thing, and then he also, the centurion has seen Jesus die, so he knows what he looks like, right? Because there's no pictures in 33 AD. And, um, and then he goes into this room with the apostle, and, and there is Jesus, and Jesus is this really like, hey, that's right, it's me, I'm alive. And, um, and then he goes, oh, 
I guess I have to believe too, or I'm so confused, I don't know what to do. And then the apostles go, come with us, and they all go out to this kind of deserty area that has some water, and several of the apostles and the centurion get on a boat, and they go out, and the apostles throw out their fishing net on the left side of the boat, and they're pulling it back, there's no fish. And then all of a sudden, Jesus appears on the sand and says, why don't you try the right side of the boat? <laughs> And then they throw the net to the right side of the boat, and there's a lot of fish. And then the Roman Tribune goes, I have to believe. And he's like tearing off his robe. I believe, I believe. Okay, this is my question about it. Okay, this is what I realized. It was actually really great for me to do this because it's been like 10 years since I lost my faith and I really just don't watch any, I just ignore all the Christian stuff. But to really immerse myself in it, like I did the last year, it was really educational. For one thing, what is it with the freaking miracles meaning something? Like, if somebody came in and said, I tell you, slap your child every morning and lie to everyone you meet. And you say, well, I don't want to do that. But look at this miracle! And then they did a miracle. Would you say, oh, I guess I really have to slap my kid every morning and lie to... I mean, the whole idea is that the whole message of Jesus, of just all the message that we all know about Jesus, is completely lost. It's all about somebody performs a miracle, therefore you believe everything they say about a completely other subject. <laughs> I don't get it. Okay, I'm going faster. The shack! Oh my god, you guys, the shack. I kid you not, this is the plot of the shack. A guy named Mac. Oh, also, I'm so tired of people who believe in God until their own child dies or gets sick, and then they question their faith. Do they not look around at the world or know anyone who's ever had trouble with anyone? Okay, so this guy, his he has three daughters, and one of them is killed, and so he loses his faith in God, and then he gets a letter in the mail saying, meet Papa at the shack. Now that's interesting because Papa's the name that he, his wife and his daughters called God. So how, and no one knew that. So he goes to the shack for a weekend and that's where he meets God, who is, I kid you not, Octavia Spencer. <laughs> yes, it's God as character actress. <laughs> and she invites him in the cabin and she says, that's right, I'm God. And I'm here with two other gods, my son Jesus, and then there's this Jewish looking guy who's a carpenter who literally comes out with like a hammer. Hi, I'm Jesus. And the Holy Spirit, which is this Asian chick who looks like she's taken quaalude. She's like, hey man. <laughs> and she goes, yeah, she's the Holy Spirit. And then he hangs out at the shack with God, with these three people. And it's so Oprah-esque God stuff. Like Octavia, like, Max says to Octavia Spencer, God, he says, wait a minute. I thought you're supposed to punish people. You're a mean God. And Octavia Spencer says, who told you that? Um, you know what I say? Having to live with the fact that you've sinned is punishment enough. Which I personally find so heinous. I mean, <laughs> this is, where, I mean, the truth is uh, there's a lot of people who've sinned or done terrible things who don't really care that they've done terrible things. And that's one of the things that I hate about the kind of Oprah-fied view of God, where it's like, hey, everybody's just on a journey. They're just in a different place. It's like, well, actually, some people do need to be punished and kept away from other people. So, <laughs> I mean, anyway, oh, God, that one. Oh, then this is my favorite thing. The son, the carpenter, he takes him on a boat ride. There's a lot of boat rides with the Jesuses. He takes him on a boat ride, and they're out in the middle of the lake, and then <laughs> Jesus gets out of the boat in the middle of the lake, but he's standing on the water. And then Matt goes, what? I can't believe it. And then Jesus goes, come on, you can do it too. And then he stands, and then Jesus goes, let's run. And then they run across the water. <laughs> okay, I just want to say that movie cost $20 million and made $100 million. Okay. Okay, I'm just doing one more. I'll, I'll just end with, okay. The war room, oh my God, I don't know if you, okay, the war room, the great thing about it, all African-American cast, this one cost $3 million, made $70 million. There's a woman, she's a real estate agent, she has a really awful husband, oh my God, he's so terrible. 
um, and at the, begin, at the beginning, she was using a lot of Christian-y kind of words, like she says to her friend, oh, my husband is so difficult. Submission is hard. And I was like, submission is hard? Oh, that's such a creepy thing to say. <laughs> and I'm like, ugh. And then her friend says, you know, submission is ducking so God can kit your husband. How creepy is that? And then she goes to this woman's house that she's going to sell her house, and it's Miss Clara. And Miss Clara has taken a closet in her house and put all of these biblical sayings on it. And she goes in there, and that's her war room where she f tells God how to fix the world. And she convinces the real estate agent that she should do that. And the real estate agent cleans out a closet. That's a big, hilarious montage. She's cleaning out her closet to put up the signs of Jesus and the sayings of Jesus. And her husband, in the meantime, is in another city courting another woman, about to have an affair. And she finds out about it. And so she prays to God to do something. And you cut back and forth between her in her war room, praying to God to not let her husband cheat on her. And then you cut back to the husband who's flirting with the young woman. And then all of a sudden, the husband goes, oh, uh, uh, and it turns out he has terrible indigestion, and he throws up. That's what God did to stop him. Have the affair. Yeah. Okay. I only have one more, and I really feel like I've, you've really indulged me. I just want to say my family is going to be so happy for this day to be over because <laughs> it got so depressing watching these movies. Like, at first it was funny, like, God's not dead. Like, oh, this is ridiculous. And then by, like, the 10th movie, I was, like, on my side in the fetal position, and my daughter would come home from school and go, what's the matter? And I'd go, I just watched The Case for Christ. <laughs> the whole thing. Mulan's like, when does this end? I go, when we go to the Freedom from Religion Foundation. <laughs> okay, so the last one I'll tell you about actually didn't make money, but I thought it was interesting why it didn't make money. Okay, so Focus Features, which is also a big production company, they're trying to get in on the Christian act. So they make this movie called The Young Messiah, which is based on an Anne Rice novel, and it's all about Jesus at age seven. And I actually, this was the only one I didn't make it all the way through. I really, after half of it, it was so horrible. So it's Jesus, age seven, in Egypt with Mary and Joseph and his older brother, James. See how heretical this one is. And um, Jesus, oh, oh, by the way, they're in the Middle East, in Egypt, and this is how the seven-year-old Jesus talks. Mother, I have a question for you. He has a little English accent. Why did the butterflies come today, Mommy? Okay. And literally, he goes out, and there's a dead bird, and he picks it up, and it comes to life. And he goes, Mother, I don't understand it. I picked up a bird, and it came back to life. And then his mother has a Spanish accent. She's like, I don't know. I could say, oh, God, I don't know what to do with this. And then Joseph, the father, comes in and goes, Mary, we've got to talk to Jesus about who his real father is. <laughs> and, then, and then the young Jesus goes out, and he sees a leper, and he goes, oh. And he touches the leper, and the leper is suddenly cured. And the leper turns with his new, beautiful new face. And Jesus goes, mommy, I don't know. <laughs> Now, now I've lost the accent. I can't understand what's happening. I'm making him into Oliver Twist. <laughs> could, I, could I have some more, please? Sort of like that. Mommy, why did that man get so... Now I've made him a beetle. Um, why did he get so cured? And Mary goes, oh, Joseph, we've got to talk to Jesus. <laughs> and I could not finish that one. Now that one is the only one of these that didn't make money. It cost $18.5 million because they shot it like in Spain and all over the place. This movie cost so much money. And it only made $7 million at the box office. Yeah. Okay, now. Okay, so that's the end of that. All right. Now, I know you're depressed about it. Part of me the whole time was like, I have to stop my life and write atheist movies, I guess. But, you know, atheist movies are just movies. <laughs> okay? I mean, like... I don't think it's right to try to think that we're going to come up with some, I mean, oh, God. And I can't decide if these films are a terrible sign of the future 
or if they're kind of this last gasp. Because I have to say, when you look, when you go online and you read the comments section about these movies, half the people hate them because they're secularists like us, you know, people who just hate the world. And then, the, but the other half of them who hate them are really conservative Christians who think that they've misinterpreted the Bible in some way. So it's not like it's universally accepted, although they have made a really lot of money. And now Pure Flix has like five movies coming. There's one coming out next month called Same Kind of Different as Me, starring Greg Kinnear again. And um, so now I know I was supposed to get up here and just be funny only. I'm so sorry about that. But I do hope that I have educated you a little bit about the horrendous Christian film landscape out there. And thank you for having me.